Praise God. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24 tonight. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. How I many know we serve a faithful God? And he's going to keep you whole. Amen. Would you pray with me right now? I love you, Jesus. I thank you for the people of God that are here tonight. I ask you, Lord, that you let my mouth right now become the pen of a ready writer, God, as it were. Speak through me your wonderful words of life to your people that are here tonight, God, in Jesus' name. You know the hurting, the wounding that are here, God, those, God, who are carrying heavy burdens. Lighten the burden. Break the yoke, I pray, God, in Jesus' name. If somebody said, in Jesus' name, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to take this topic tonight. Image and likeness. Image and likeness. As Christians, we have to understand that there is a tripart nature to man. In order to help people get to the root of their problems, what has plagued them for years, sometimes over a lifetime. Some people have fought battles since they were teenagers, and they're in their midlife right now. They're older some are younger. Some have fought battles in their health, and some have felt battles, fought battles in their minds where they have struggled with things. And so the Lord knows how to help us get victory over that in our spirit, soul, and body. He is coming back for a people who have made themselves ready and have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that's great and wonderful. We thank God for the plan of salvation. But sometimes even after we've been born again, there are lingering things that need to be dealt with in order for us to be whole and to be made perfect and complete in him. That's what that scripture is talking about, that we preserve blameless. We're whole. The very God of peace is the, the God tonight of wholeness and the God of completeness. It's good to see Sister Star. She was in the hospital over the weekend. And she's here in the house of the Lord with us. Let's thank God for her being here. Praise God. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created man in his image and in his likeness. I'm glad tonight that we were made in his image and likeness. Our original intent, the original intent was for man to have dominion over the fish of the sea. Man lost that dominion because of the thing called sin in the garden, when that first man, Adam, partake, partook of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil in disobedient to the word of the Lord, and all sin came upon us as a result of that situation, to the point where God said that because of that, he no longer had that dominion, and also that every time he would plant something and work, he would be sweating, and it would be hard and difficult to manage. How many like to work in the garden? Some people do. How many like when you're working in the garden, you get thorns and it punctures your skin? That's all. You can thank Adam for that tonight. Say, thank you, Adam. Thank you. And so, thank God for Jesus Christ, the second man, Adam, who came and because of his finished work at Calvary and his resurrecting from the dead and the the fact that he poured out his spirit upon the church, we today are able to regain that dominion in Christ. And I'm glad for that tonight and thankful for it. When we talk about the image of God, we're talking about the image of man, we're talking about the total man, that trichotomy, the image of God. The spirit is transformed. The spirit of the man is transformed. It is it's the, it becomes a new creature. We are born again. This is where the Holy Ghost dwells. If the unregenerated spirit, it's empty of God's presence until 
we are filled with his spirit. And because of that, many people suffer uh, demonic attacks and spiritual woundings from the enemy because they have not been sealed by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the spirit of the man, this is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, both your spirit and the Spirit of God are hermetically sealed, as it were, together until we find ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the holy seal of promise. And the Bible lets us know that when the Lord comes back for His church and that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain are caught up to meet Him in the air. Those are for those individuals that have been recipients of the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many have the Holy Ghost tonight? If you raise your hand, if you have the Holy Ghost, you've been sealed to the day of redemption. How many are looking forward to that great day? Yeah. Amen. I'm looking forward towards it more and more every day. I want to go up. And we used to sing a song when I was a kid, say, I'm going up, I'm going up, I'm going up in that first resurrection. I'm going to go up and I'm going to be with my Lord. Amen. And that happens because I have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, but my spirit is that part of me that deals with uh, that transformation. It is the temple where God's Spirit dwells. That soul is my mind. It is my will. It is my emotions. It's subject to attack sometimes by tormenting and oppressive spirits through the thought life. You begin to dwell on things. And How many like sad country music? If you listen to sad country music too long, you're going to be feeling sad. I mean, somebody shot your dog, ran off with your wife, you lost your job, and your truck got stolen. Praise God. And so you find yourself listening to sad music, so you got you to gotta change the atmosphere in your mind. By look, the Bible says thinking on those positive things. What sort of things are lovely, just, pure, uh, of virtuous, or good being, virtue and praise. Think on those things. And so... The soul is that area of our mind that we think about, our will, what we choose to do, our emotions. And your emotion is a, result, a direct result of your mindset. Have you ever woke up in a grumpy mood and something happened that normally you would not have responded to? But on that day, Katie barred the door. You're going to, Annie, you're smiling. I know that you know what I'm talking about. My wife knows what I'm talking about because I get grumpy a lot. So we deal with that, this oppressive spirit, these emotions that are a direct result of our mindset because we have lost sometimes the understanding of where the true battleground is. The battleground is in your mind. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul went on to write, that was in Ephesians, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he writes, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. That word imagination has to do with carnal reasoning and with fleshly calculations. How many like to calculate, figure out things, and reason your mind how it's going to work? And how many times has that not even happened that way? We thought it's going to be this way, and bless God, it didn't come out about that way. Anytime you begin reasoning with your human intellect and begin, I'm talking about when it comes to spiritual things, and try to calculate and, and compute, compute how everything's going to work out, it never works out the way you thought it was going to work out. Because God's got a better plan for you, and we are casting down those imaginations, that thought life that is contrary to God's perfect will, and every high thing, it says, that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought, to the obedience of Christ. So if you've got thoughts that are running this way and that way and, and they're causing you to have anxiety and worry and you're fretting and, and you're thinking about doing things you, you don't do, maybe there's something you haven't done in a long time, a temptation you dealt with, and you're thinking, well, I'd like to do that again. Maybe I should go do that. Now I'm telling you tonight, you need to cast down that imagination and that thought and every high thing that exalts itself against God, against the knowledge of God. And bring those thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The best way to bring a thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ for the way it is to begin praying. Seek the face of God. 
talk to him. And that's the best way to start bringing that there. And it says, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It's a good thing tonight when we see people's lives changed and what happened in their past, it seems to just dissipate because God is taking vengeance upon those things that happened in their life because they have now put themselves in a position to obey him. And then you got the body. The body is subject to attacks by the spirit, spirits of infirmity, weakness, and disease uh, through improper habits of uh, exercise. I'm, I'm the worst person to talk about this tonight. Nutrition, safety. When I used to work on a job, I was the guy that would, even though I had a harness on, I'd jump from scaffold to scaffold. And, my, and I was a lot lighter back then. But my buddy would say, Steve, stop. You're scaring me. I was too dumb to be scared, I guess. I was trusting that harness, Brother Carter. I was thinking, I'm, no, even if I fall, that harness is going to protect me. So, but you are subject to those attacks. Your body is. And so that is what we're dealing with. We're talking about the image, this image of God. We were created in his image. We were created in his likeness. The likeness has to do with the goings and doings of life. It is the choices that we make. How many woke up this morning and made a choice? You made, when you woke up this morning, you made a choice to get out of bed. When you woke up this morning, you made a choice to either shower or not shower. I hope you showered. When, amen. When you woke up this morning, you decided what color clothes you're going to put on. If, you, if this particular pair of socks matches this particular shirt you got on, that's what you decided to do. Because you have the ability to choose. You have a free will. And so God has given us that choice. And we can choose the likeness that we want to pursue. Do you want to pursue God's likeness? Or do you want to pursue some other form and likeness? So we have a lot of people that are fans of country singers. I don't know what we mean on country. We can be rock and roll. It can be rap. It can be anything. Actors. We're fans of different people. And sometimes we're more fanatic about these other worldly influences than we are about Jesus Christ. Uh, we should be coming to church like fans come to church, getting here as early as we can because we want to see what God's going to do in the house of God on the service night see who's going to be healed and who's going to be delivered and who's going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Though That's what we should be doing if we're really fanatical about Jesus. And so Mark, Jesus wrote in a book, or Mark wrote regarding Jesus, and they sent unto him a certain Pharisee of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. You know, the enemy likes to trip up people. They even try to trip up Jesus. He was too smart for him, And when they came... They say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? They're basically trying to dare him to speak against Caesar, against the, the Roman law that was in power. They were the ones in power in Jerusalem and, so, and in Israel. And so Jesus, they continue to say, Shall we give or shall we not give? But he knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why tempt you me? Bring me a penny, and that I may see it. And they brought it to him, and he saith unto them, Whose image, whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Render to Caesar all the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are, are God's. And they marveled at him. The question, the reason why I read that text is, ask yourself this question tonight, whose image is on you? And what likeness do you display? Do you bear the image of Caesar, of the world, or do you bear the image of Jesus Christ? When they see you, they, they see Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's this image that should be stamped upon you, inscribed upon you. Uh, so the question then is, which image is on you? Whose image is on you? And why do we do the things that we do sometimes? So how many have done something and asked yourself as soon as you did it, now why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I go there? You know, I have done that often. I immediately, words come out of my mouth, and within seconds I'm thinking, now why did I even talk about that? Why did I bring that up? Why, why did I go there? The key to life is to learn, first of all, to be quiet. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good key to learn. I haven't mastered that yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, the other thing is, you have to learn to accept responsibility for your actions. Your actions are the likeness that you choose. Learn 
If you're going to do those things, then you better be ready to accept responsibility for the things you've done. And every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's a law. And that's true in spiritual life as well. There are consequences to actions. And so you've got to be very careful to make sure that when you do something, you're going to remember, listen, I chose to go in this direction. God gave you the ability, because we're like Him, He said, let us make man in our image. We get to choose things that we can do. We get to act ways that we want to act, because God has given us that ability through the power of creation and being made in His image and after His likeness. I want to note tonight that unless there is an open door in your life, evil spirits cannot freely attack you. We do not pick up an evil spirit while walking down the street. You might be sensitive to that spirit, but if you have the Holy Ghost, the Lord is making you sensitive for a reason. Maybe it's because the person with that spirit needs deliverance, and you're the only one around that can be used by God at that time to bring deliverance into their life. Many have opened the door before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and so that was because the Spirit of God in them was low and level because they didn't have the Holy Ghost. Satan then starts invading their mind with thoughts and, and suggestions and things of this nature, even to the point where people begin to believe the things that they're hearing in their mind, that the, spirit, the evil spirit of the devil is putting there. He's talking about things, your illusion, there being any better than this, you should do this, you should, nobody wants you around. That is what the devil is trying to lie to you, to tell you, because he wants to destroy you. Why? Because the spirit of the man has allowed the Holy Ghost to become low in their life. Even spirit-filled people get to that place sometimes where the enemy begins oppressing them coming against them, and they wonder, why am I feeling this way? Sometimes, not all the time, this is not a general rule, sometimes it doesn't happen this way, but many times because the Holy Ghost inside of you has become low, in, in that you have not renewed and been renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you, through the power of the Holy Ghost, have the right to evict all unwelcome guests to your body, your soul, and your spirit. You can say to the enemy tonight, devil, get off of me. This is God's territory and you're trespassing on holy ground. You're trespassing. You do not have a legal right to be here. And so you begin to speak to him that way and pray in the name of Jesus. And this will bring you to a point you begin to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you'll become refreshed and your body will get the sleep and the nourishment that you need as you begin to trust in God to help you in that situation. So we also renew in the spirit of our mind by praying in the Holy Ghost and praising God. Listen, if you're depressed and down and, and worried about things, why don't you just take the time to praise Jesus? Think upon him. Begin to think about how good he is and, and what he has done for you. The book of Romans tells us that when you're going through trials and tribulations, it gives us faith and experience, works hope and all that because we know that God has delivered us already. He's going to do it again. And you can trust in him to keep you delivered tonight. And so you, when you're going through the trial, the tribulation, the, 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 the time of depression, the time of anxiety, begin to praise the Lord, begin to pray into God, and then let the Holy Ghost inside of you be renewed. You can begin speaking in other tongues as God's Spirit gives you that ability and that utterance because it is a renewing or a recharging, you, if you will, of your Holy Ghost battery. It's not that you're, you lose the Holy Ghost. Once you're born again, you're born again. But how many know you can, you can become cold sometimes? It's not that the Holy Ghost becomes cold. It's because you become cold. Because somewhere in your spirit, in your mind, in your soul, in your emotions, and your will, you have gone a different direction. And the Lord is gently trying to pull you back to him. Sometimes it's not so gentle. How many know that adversity comes sometimes? But sometimes it comes to get us to come back full circle to Jesus, to get our attention. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the lifestyle, the former goings and doings, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
and that you put on the new man, which after God, the image of God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. We are created in his image, and we have that walk with him because we, in his image, we put him on, we begin to walk in righteousness and in true holiness. Not falsity, not hypocrisy, but true holiness before God. Amen. How many know that the mind that cannot maintain a common relationship with the Lord, if the heart holds the things such as resentment, bitterness, and hatred. Your spirit, soul, and body cannot be whole if you're holding on to anger against somebody, if you're holding on to some petty little disagreement. Uh, maybe it was a big deal, but you still got to let it go. So we're fighting that sometimes. We're, we're holding on to things, and we have to learn to let them go. The Holy Spirit of God inside of you is grieved when you hold on to anger and bitterness and resentment and, and you begin to find yourself going down a path and spiraling into a situation where the Holy Ghost inside of you becomes, becomes weak. Not the Holy Ghost inside of you. It's you that become weak because you're not letting the Holy Ghost inside of you lead you. How many know that men are led by the Spirit of God? They are the sons of God. Amen. But how many of you can be a son and be a disobedient son? That means you can have the Holy Ghost, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Holy Ghost always has you. So you've got to learn to walk in obedience in Jesus. So I heard a, an old missionary say, the Holy Ghost can only flow through you as pure as you are in your spirit, soul, and body. Are you wondering why you're not getting the prayers that you have been praying for when you had prayers of God? Maybe it feels like the Lord's not answering. Maybe you're not pure in your spirit, soul, or body. What, what have you allowed to contaminate your thought life? What have you allowed to come into your life? What, what is it in your body that's going on that, that's causing you to not be able to, to pray like you want to pray or do things that you used to do for the Lord? Maybe that extra slice of pizza needs to be put away. You think, well, that's silly, but no, it's not. It's your body. See, a, a, a sick body naturally can come under spirit, attack spiritually. We talk about that. We talk about people that have, uh, uh, what's that? It's called a, a psychosomatic disorder. But God wants us to maintain our bodies before him in holiness. And we're going to be held accountable for what we know to do tonight. How many know how to treat people right? Amen. How many have treated everybody right your entire life? I haven't always done that. Now, I've made excuses. Well, they deserved it. I remember one time my mother, when I was a boy, she said, now, Steve, she said, the Bible says that you're supposed to treat people the way that you want to be treated. I said, I'm doing that. They wanted to be treated that way, and that's how I'm treating them. I think I missed the point. Sometimes when we're dealing with the spirit, soul, and body, there is a strong link between sickness and sin, between sickness and fear or anxiety. Uh, many, I've read many writers have talked about a strong distinction between sickness and uh, bitterness that causes sickness. Uh, it manifests itself in what psychologists call psychosomatic disorder, the body-mind the body has an effect on the mind, and the mind has an effect on the body. And so James gave us the antidote for these issues. He said, is any, sick, um, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That seems to indicate that sometimes your sickness is the result of some sin in your life that needs to be forgiven. Because we're talking about the whole spirit, soul, and body. It is working together. And so then he says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word false there is sins. You look it up in the Greek, it's sins. And so what we do is, uh, I don't think you go to everybody and confess your faults, 
but maybe you've mistreated somebody. You go to that person and confess your fault to them. I'm sorry that I did this to you. Please forgive me. When you do that, you open up a channel for God to come in and heal you. But if you refuse and you continue offending or hurting, or maybe you continue holding on to a bitterness and a grudge, you close off the windows of heaven for you to be healed. So you've got to be careful that you walk in faith with God, but you also keep yourself pure from these things that stop you from receiving all the blessings that God has for you. And so Christians who obey the word of God and follow Jesus with an undivided heart, they bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that obedience is the best revenge upon the past life of sin that you were involved in. The best revenge that can ever be taken on the enemy is for you to walk in faith and be pure in your spirit, soul, and body for when the Lord comes. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the Lord to come. I'm going to be pure in my spirit, soul, and body before he comes. And so we have a choice regarding these issues of likeness and image, image and likeness. Who do you want to model? Are you going to model Jesus or are you going to model the system of the world? The system of the world is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Are you going to model that system or are you going to model the system of Jesus, which is righteousness and true holiness? Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin or death or of obedience unto righteousness. Uh, you might say I'm a Christian, but are you living like a Christian ought to live? Are you making decisions that a Christian ought to make? Are you treating people the way Christians ought to treat people? Because if you're not, then you are actually serving another master. And the Bible lets us know you cannot serve two masters. You're either going to love the one or hate the other or vice versa. You cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to choose. That's why he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. The interesting thing about that passage in the book of jo uh, Joshua was... Joshua was saying that in the last chapter of Joshua. You choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Meanwhile, the entire nation is saying, we're going to keep this commandment. We're going to keep this oath. We're going to do this. We're committing ourselves to Jehovah. And he is saying to them, you can't do this. He has led them for years. He sat under Moses while Moses led the children the Hebrews through the wilderness and they became the nation of Israel and now he's leading them into the promised land and parsing out lands and he's at the end of his life and he knows that there is within them this, this backsliding thing that goes on in their lives and how they turn away from God and he is saying listen you better be careful before you commit this oath before God because you're going to have a hard time keeping it and I've come to tell you tonight that living for Jesus is the best thing you ever can do in your life but it's not always the easiest thing you can do it's not always easy to treat people right who don't treat you right at all. It's not always easy to love people who betray you and wound you and hurt you and lie to you. But Jesus did it. And if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to learn to do it not your way, but the Jesus way. So know ye not to whom you yield yourselves in service to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. How many are thankful that we're serving righteousness tonight? I walk in a righteous path before a righteous God. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity into iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to a righteousness unto holiness. In other words, he is speaking to them because he knew that their flesh could be weak. There's another verse that says the spirit's willing, but the flesh is what? It's weak. There's some things I want to do that I don't always do. 
I, I, there's a war going on. I'll talk about it in a little bit. There's a war going on in my members. And so I know that. He's saying, I am going to talk to you about this because there is a weakness in your flesh. Even so, yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. How do you do that? Through obedience, through obeying the Word of God, through reading the Scriptures and studying them, through coming to Bible study on Tuesday night, listening to the taught Word of God, and realizing i got to make these changes in my life to live a life of righteousness and a life of holiness. Then he goes on to say, What fruit had you then? For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Think about that. When you were the servants of sin, you had a certain amount of freedom from righteousness. Who wants to be freed from righteousness tonight? I don't be freed from righteousness. I want to be bound to the righteousness of God. I want every step to be taken in holiness and righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you're made free from sin. You're no longer the servant of, right, of, of unrighteousness, the servant of sin, but you are now the servant of righteousness. You are freed from that, and because of that, you have a, you have a gift coming. The wages of sin is death. That means you've got to work to go to hell. Look at somebody who said, don't take that job. That pay, the pay on that job stinks. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you decide to carry the image and likeness of God, you, you will live in victory because of some certain truths. How many want to live in victory? Yeah. Amen. The preacher talked about tonight, Brother Carter, we can live in victory. We, we know we have victory ahead of us because the trial is coming. But there, it is a state of mind that you live in. I am going to be victorious. And it may not always look like I'm victorious. It, the evidence might be to the contrary. But don't let your present circumstances dictate how you approach victory in the name of Jesus. If God has given you a word, you hold on to that word. Don't let anything in life pull it away from you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. He has spoken and he will not take it back. And so you can say, I will not fear what man can do to me because I trust in the word of God. So there are some things here. Number one, when you became a Christian, you were separated from the power and enticement of sin. Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 2, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How many know that we don't have to live in sin any longer? We become dead to sin. Okay? So you are separated from the power and the enticement of sin. I know that every man and woman is tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust, their own desires. And then when that desire is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin when it's finished brings forth death. I understand that, but you have the power to live above that tonight because of what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. The other thing you have to understand about being victorious is that you are alive unto God. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but now you're alive unto God. Likewise, uh, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your spirit has been regenerated. You are a servant of the Most High God, and you have a victory in your life because you are alive unto Him. We used to sing another song that said, I was dead, but now I live. Oh, glory, glory, glory to the great eternal God. I was lost, but Jesus found me. I was dead, but now, that's 80 years I was dead, but now I live. Oh, glory, glory, glory to the great eternal I was dead in trespasses and in sins. But when I got a hold of Jesus and he got a hold of me and I repented and was baptized in his name and I came up out of that water a new man in Christ Jesus and was filled with his Holy Spirit, I became alive. Number three, it's the finished work of Calvary that satisfies the demands of the law and the payment for our sin. There was a price for your sins. 
Somebody had to die to pay that blood sacrifice for your sins. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 7 and 4, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. I don't have to worry about the law anymore because Christ died for me. I'm going to walk in faith and in victory knowing that Jesus has taken care of it all for me and he did the finished work there. Nobody has to go and die for me again. All I have to do is call out to Jesus in repentance and he will hear me. Also, number four, sin no longer has control over you. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of righteousness, unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over ye, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin does not have to have dominion over you. You have victory over that if you want to choose that path. You have the choice today. That's part of your likeness. I can do the things of God or I can do something else. I go down this path of righteousness or I can go down this this path of sin. I can be the servant of unrighteousness or I can be the servant of righteousness. I get to choose in that. But the fact of the matter is you have victory through Jesus Christ because he's made it possible for you to have dominion over sin and not for sin to have dominion over you. So you are freed from sin. And so there's still a battle going on. Even though you're freed from sin, there is still a battle going on between the law of God and the law of sin. And that presents us this choice for this image and likeness that we're talking about. You choose. He said in the book of Romans chapter 7, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he gives you the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You don't have to be bound by the flesh tonight. You can, with your mind, choose to be in the image and the likeness of God and live victorious over sin. So don't let sin reign over your mortal body. You already have the victory in Jesus. The problem is the enemy tries to convince us that we don't have victory. And we sometimes are so dull that we listen to his voice. So the law of the Spirit is more powerful than the law of sin and death. There is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. How many want to live? God has a great, he has, the Bible says the, the, the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God wants you to live in peace. He wants you to live in harmony. He wants you to live with joy. He wants you to have all the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. That you would have love and joy and peace, be long-suffering, gentle, good, faith, and meekness. He wants all that to be transpiring and occurring in your life, giving you that abundant life. And he's given you the power and the victory to do that because of what Jesus did for us at Calvary. And then the victory that Christ purchased for you helps you to approach every temptation from a position of victory. Every, every, every temptation that comes your way, you can approach it from a position of victory. You recognize it for what it is. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and principality and power and might and dominion every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come it's talking about the fact that he has purchased this for you you have access to it tonight he has given it to you and Jesus Christ is far above all principalities remember we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers 
We went to worship workers of darker in this, darkness in this world, spiritual weakness in high places. He's talking about with, through Jesus Christ, we can have that victory because he, he is far above all principalities, all powers, all mights, all dominions, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world to come. And then later on, that same chapter, he said, he's made us to raise us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his of his grace. That's what Jesus has done for us tonight. He has given us that ability to walk in the image and in the likeness of his grace. Okay? The seeding riches of his grace in, the kind, in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. How am I thankful for the kindness of God tonight? He has been so kind to us to offer us this plan of salvation that he would die for us and make unto himself a people that will be called by his name. Now, I know that temptations come. I have faced temptations. You have faced temptations. And when they come, we usually wonder, Lord, why? Uh, I found out that when the temptation comes, as I said a while ago, it is giving you a chance here to be victorious. Temptation should be a positive sign to you who walk in faith and are mature in your walk with God because what temptation tells you is that the devil knows God's about to do something and he wants to destroy what God is going to do in your life. He wants to sidestep you and sidetrack you from what God has for you. See, when God works in heaven, he, has a creative, he is a creative God. He's creating great things in your life. And the enemy reacts against the creative power of God to try to stop and stymie that. And you have a choice tonight. You can either work in the creative process of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you can choose to react like the devil reacts and fall into sin and to temptation. But God has given you the ability tonight to choose that. And that's where we're talking about his image and his likeness. You get to choose, will I follow the right path or will I follow another path? I don't know about you, but I want to follow the right path. I want to be in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. So the writer said, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put him on. How do I put on the Lord Jesus Christ? You need to pray. You need to read your Bible. Book of Romans tells us that when you do that, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It also calls it the armor of light. Galatians, Paul wrote about it and said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. You have to put on the helmet of salvation. You need to put on the, uh, take the shield of faith, put on the breastplate of righteousness, your loins good about with truth, your feet for preparation of the gospel of peace, and by all means, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's a two-edged sword, by the way. It cuts going in and out. And the Bible tells you that the sword of the, the word of God, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, and the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts, the intents of the heart. That means it shows yourself to yourself. It not only tells you what you did was wrong, but if you allow the Holy Ghost and the word of God to speak to you, he will tell you why you did what you did in the first place so you'll never do it again. Oftentimes we repent. But we repent and go on our way and never really take the time to let God speak to us about why we did what we did. That's what grace does. Grace teaches you how to not do those things anymore. Because it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It, grace is a teacher. And so when you repent, you need to allow grace time to teach you how to avoid that particular situation again so that you can choose to walk in the image and in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ and be victorious in Jesus. Amen. Let's stand tonight. Hallelujah. Would you come forward? We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to talk to the Lord tonight and let him speak to us. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Well, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is through him for he to victory beneath 
the cleansing flood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Well, he sought me and he brought me with his redeeming blood. Well, he loved me. Beneath the cleansing flood, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his glory of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Well, he sought me and he brought me I want you to know that victory is already assured through Christ Jesus. You already have victory tonight. You just got to receive it and believe it's there and walk in faith. It says, I'm walking in victory. Would you close your eyes tonight? I'm not even going to, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm not, nobody's looking. I'm not even looking. But you might say, I've been sick in my body. And while you were talking, I began to think, you know what? There's some unforgiveness in my heart. If you'd raise your hand right now, just signify that before God. I'm not even looking. All right. You put your hand down, and I want you to pray right now. Jesus, you see the unforgiveness in my heart. You see what I did that I should not have done. It may be blocking the blessings that you have for me, and I'm asking to forgive me tonight in Jesus' name and make me whole, God, because I want to be whole in my spirit, soul, and body so that you can flow through me purely, God, in the name of Jesus. And I can have that God of peace, that God of wholeness working in my life and through my life. In Jesus' name.